Hello, everybody. It is I, uh, your friendly neighborhood INFP writer man here. And today I had wanted to look at a particular book. If you haven't guessed from the title, uh, that book is, of course, How to Make Friends and Influence People. And the thing I'm going to do with this book is I'm going to be making videos uh, based on each chapter. So it's not going to be me reading the chapter. It's not going to be... It, some of it's going to be review, but it's mostly going to be my thoughts on each chapter or opinions or whatever you want to call it. And there are some very interesting things that are a part of it that... I'll talk about a little bit later, but one of the things I wanted to start off with is that uh, it's a it's an excellent book. I've only gotten through parts of chapter, I've gotten through all of chapter one, and I'm now in the process of going through chapter two, which has so much unbelievable stuff in it. Um, and this entire book has a lot of unbelievable stuff in it, so... I wanted to, if you're going to pick up the book, or if you wanted to um, look into things, uh, there are nine things that the book says that you should do. And some of those things are, well, actually all of those things are, give me a second so, uh, so I can flip to the page. The nine suggestions to get the most out of this book. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. Number one, or A, whatever you want to call it. Number one, develop a deep driving desire to master the principles of human relations. Uh, for those of us who are in the personality sphere, in MBTI, in Enneagram, in Socionics, in any kind of psychological profiling, personality type thing, like, you know, how everybody knows that I am part of the MBTI community, perhaps maybe a little bit more on the fringes than whoop, or maybe I'm deep in and I just don't realize it. Anyways, uh, the first one should be a very big thing for personality people like us to get into. The uh, second one is read each chapter twice before going on to the next one. Uh, I've done that with chapter one, I'm going to do that with chapter two, and I'm going to do that uh, with all the remaining, you don't have to, but if you want to like dive into it and like get, like suck out the, uh, all the stuff that will help you or the information, I'm going to try doing that and see what happens. Hopefully something good. Uh, third one is, as you read, stop frequently to ask yourself how you can apply each suggestion. Uh, still working on that one. Actually, no, no. <coughs> I started to work on that one, so uh, there is that. Uh, that's three. The fourth is underscore each important idea. So highlight, underline, asterisk, whatever you want to do that like catches your eye. Just like put it there and be like, oh, this this caught my eye, and just uh, so that there's that. Review this book each month. I will attempt to do that. Uh, apply these principles at every opportunity. Use this volume as a working handbook to help you solve your daily problems. Started working on that. Make a living game out of your learning by offering some friend a dime or a dollar every time he or she catches you violating one of these principles. Well, uh, I don't have really any friends in real life. So that would be a bit tricky. I could do with my family, but that's a little mm, mm, mm. Uh, some things I just want to separate from certain things. Uh, but if you guys have friends, by all means, go ahead and do that. It is just a suggestion. As it, it says, nine suggestions to get the most out of this book. And in that, like... Um, part of the book it goes a little bit into more detail about each of these suggestions and why uh you should be going to but that's not the purpose of this video the purpose of this video is chapter one i just want to get through these nine so that i can get to chapter one anyways um doo -doo -doo. then we have number eight check up each week on the progress you are making ask yourself what mistakes you have made what improvement what lessons you have learned for the future 
chapter one will all already be giving you so many lessons for the future. It is not even funny. And it's just, that's just chapter one. And then keep notes in the back of this book showing how and when you have applied these principles. You know, I'm not much of a note keeper. <clears throat> and I wouldn't know how to apply these notes in the first place. But if you are the type who likes taking notes and making notes and doing all that kind of stuff, by all means, go ahead, do it. It would probably help you out. Um, probably not me because I... Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I might, might not do it. But anyways, chapter one. So... With chapter one, it starts off by telling a story, specifically a story about a two, the two, a guy by the name of Two Gun Crowley, um, who of uh, May 7th, 1931, yes. Uh, so in 1931, there was a guy by the name of May Crowley. Is that right? Is two Gun Crowley, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> two Gun Crowley, who. Uh, basically, he shot a police officer after he was making out with his girlfriend. And the police officer came, tap, tap, tap on the window. He shot him, stepped out of the car, took the policeman's off, like the policeman's gun, revolver, shot him with the policeman's own revolver. Basically, a little overkill. And it goes on to say that there was like a massive gun showdown between cops outside and the apartment. And... Um, in blood, in like the paper writing blood, he had this to say about himself. Uh, under my coat is a weary heart, but a kind one. Uh, one that would do nobody any harm. For most of us hearing this about such a violent person who a uh, police commissioner at the time said that this man will kill at the drop of the hat, no questions asked, and is the most dangerous man currently... The typical reaction of the people of that time and of this time, when you know about him, would be something akin to... Right. Um... Uh, going on to when he was sentenced to death, and he's like, this is what I get for defending myself. Yes. Defending yourself by a policeman knocking on your window, asking you to roll it down so that he could see your papers, and then shooting him was self-defense. Right! I don't believe you! And then after that, uh, it goes and talks about Al Capone, who states about himself that, what was it, um, he regarded himself as a public benefactor and unappreciated and misunderstood public benefactor. And, uh, then you've got like people in the, um, Sing Sing prison, uh, the New York's infamous Sing Sing prison, uh, how most of the criminals there don't regard themselves as bad people. Uh, well, if you weren't bad people, why are you in prison? But the point that chapter one is already starting to make is that people don't like to criticize themselves at all. Um, people don't like to receive criticism. People don't like to... This is kind of, I guess, why there's this uh, whole spitting on the critics and all that kind of stuff, which you should never really do in real life. But the idea of this book is that people don't like a condemning, a critical... Thing towards themselves which is really interesting for me as an INFP because I'm always criticizing myself like anything I do I am always criticizing myself and I never until I started reading this book I didn't understand that most people aren't like that I thought a lot of people especially from what I read online are highly self-criticizing and I didn't realize that, no, no, according to this book, that's that's uh, not so much the case. In fact, it's so much not the case that it states that 99 times out of 100, people don't criticize themselves for anything, no matter how wrong it may be. Which is very interesting to think about, because um, people who are perfectionists, people who have OCD, people who have other mental issues, people who have anxiety, uh, people who have depression, they're almost constantly in a state of self-criticism. Um, INFPs, especially the ones who have perfectionist tendencies, are in a constant state of criticism, mostly because of the high standards that they have set upon themselves, and because they've set such high standards upon themselves, 
their surroundings become chaotic, as my surroundings are, um, because nothing is ever going to fit that method of perfection that they have set as an ideal. Uh, is it healthy? Not so much. It's uh, something I'm working on, something that other INFPs should work on, and other people who have such perfectionist tendencies. And not only that, because of these perfectionist tendencies, you also have the um, uh, higher desire to procrastinate. Because you can't get it exactly right, so you're like, oh, I'm just going to leave this. I can't get it right, so forget about it. Or then you get impatient because you can't get it right at the first time. That's just something I've realized uh, about myself. And uh, this book <laughs> has uh, brought interesting enlightenment to me. Uh, so that's fantastic. Uh, moving on. Um... It states that criticism is futile because it puts a person on the defensive and usually makes him strive to justify himself. Uh, criticism is dangerous because it wounds a person's precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. And this alone is why certain things in the world are the way they are. Because people criticize, there is a backlash, people then don't listen, and they backlash against their backlash, and it just becomes this never-ending cycle of criticism, hate, condemnation, and a whole bunch of bad stuff. And this book is getting to the, <coughs> excuse me, that point where it's saying, don't, don't, don't do that. But moving further... It says, by criticizing, we do not make lasting changes and often re incur resentment. Uh, and then uh, Hans Silly, another psychologist, apparently said, as much as we thirst for approval, we dread condemnation, which is true. I look for approval and I fear being condemned or getting like a harsh negative reaction, perhaps maybe to an unhealthy amount. I don't know. But it is there, <coughs> and I agree with that statement. Uh, moving fur further, I'm just going like page, page by page. It was uh, it comes like talking about the criticism. It talks about how this uh, person, who was a, uh, I guess a um, safety coordinator of an engineering company, would constantly see his workers not wearing hats, and he'd come in and he'd criticize them and he'd be very rule oriented and he's like you must wear these hats and you must do this and people would begrudgingly put them on and then when he left they would just take it off and he's like okay this obviously isn't working because he would consistently see them taking the helmet off and whenever he left and uh so instead he started to take a more nicer approach a um, is the hat uncomfortable? Is there um, something that is bothering you about it? Uh, also, guys, this is for your own protection. Um, just, you know, to keep yourself safe, to keep, like, to not make your family worry or to help out your family. Just, could you please wear the hats and just, you know, go on and... Uh, just take care of yourselves. Like, this is a very kind of dangerous work you're doing, and I would hate to see you guys get hurt. And with, a, like, a nicer um, approach to it, they wore their hats and didn't take them off. So it's just, like, an example of, like, how depending on how you word, whether it's via criticism or a nicer way, depends on how people will react, and you should always go with the nicer way. Now, before I continue, I will say this, uh, just chapter one is going to make a lot of people unable to do it, but I will get on to the reason why later on, and it's going to sting just a little, because if you think it's going to be easy, I've got one word for you later on. And so, it's, um, then it talks about uh, the conflict between Theodore Roosevelt and President Taft, and then it talks about how um, Lincoln, uh, President Lincoln, used to be a lawyer. Everybody knows he used to be a lawyer. 
and he would consistently like make these biting comments to his opponents or people he didn't like and it would just scathing articles about them he would just leave them with the newspapers or on the open streets where everyone could like he would publicly humiliate uh the people who irked him or got his ire up and it wasn't until a duel came that uh he was like he realized i don't know the story was but apparently he um he wrote what does it say uh yeah he ridiculed a vain punacious politician by the name of james shield lincoln lampooned him through an anonymous letter uh, published by the springfield journal uh, and the town roared with laughter so basically he would make these scathing uh hilarious comments that targeted people in a mean-spirited way uh, the town loved it because it would make that person look like a fool or really bad, but um, it didn't really do much good for Lincoln in the terms of relationships. And it wasn't until the guy challenged him to a duel that Lincoln realized that um, not to write such insulting things about people. And this is where he... Gets the whole favorite quotes was judge not lest ye be judged, and uh, then like Miss uh, so and then Lincoln would be like don't criticize them, uh, they are what we would be under similar circumstances. So he became a very, uh, very drastically different man after that point of the duel. I don't know the details of it. Maybe you guys do, but the point is is that he learned that maybe hitting people with such condemnation wasn't such a good idea because it brings a bad name upon himself and it hurts another person. Benjamin Franklin used to be much the same way. He would, um, what was it that he did? Yeah, okay, there we go. Um, uh, Benjamin Franklin, tactless in his youth, became so diplomatic, so adroit at handling people that he was made American, made the American ambassador to France the secret to his success was that he will speak ill of no man, he said, and speak all the good I know of everybody. Which is hard. This, this is incredibly hard to do. And the more I look at social media, the more I look at what's going on in today's world, this is extraordinarily difficult for people to do. And it's a shame because it's good advice, but people have... A hard time doing it. Mark Twain also would send scathing letters to people he didn't like, but his wife would always like hide them away, take them out of the mailbox before they were sent, because it would hurt the other person like significantly. Plus, it also made Mark Twain feel better, and no harm done if she could just take it away before it was sent off. And so, one of the other things I highlighted was when dealing with people, let us remember we are not dealing with creatures of logic, we are dealing with creatures of emotions. Creatures bristling with prejudices and motivated by pride and vanity. Oh boy, if that hasn't grown in the recent years. But I think we've always been like that. It's not like, what has, what, what really, aside from technology, and even then, has technology even increased as far as we think it has? What has really increased since the Greek era, or the Roman era, or any era? Uh, we've all had, depending on certain things, we've all been emotional creatures, we've all been subject to vanity, we've all been subject to all these things, and thus, if you let that take over, eh, not so good things might happen. Uh, so, um, then it talks about, like, uh, parents are tempted to criticize their children uh there is a thing like they're talking about um one of the classic um of american journalism is called father forgets and it appeared in apparently people's home journal but it essentially says that um before you criticize them read this first and it's not saying that you shouldn't criticize your children but you should talk to them because as the father says, as um, his last uh, 
paragraph was I'm afraid I've visualized you as a man. Yet I see as you, uh, yet as I see you now, son, crumpled and weary in your cot. I see that you are still a baby. Yesterday you were in your mother's arms. And you held your head on her shoulder. I have asked too much, too much, and like that just like gives me shivers because people. And it's true. Parents will teach like criticize their children as if they are adults. Which should not happen. There is a different approach you should take to handling your kids. You shouldn't give in to all their whims, obviously. And you should criticize them in a gentle way when they've done something wrong. Or at least talk to them in a gentle way. Like, remember, words matter. The way you give your words matter. And the last thing... Uh, last two things of this book is instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. There's a lot more, that's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticize them. And it breeds sympathy, tolerance, and kindness to know all is to forgive all. And so the principle number one is don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Now, why did I say this was going to be extraordinarily hard for many people to do? Um, bosses you don't like, you're going to criticize, complain, condemn. Um, neighbors you don't like, same thing. But the number one thing, the number one thing that shows you're going to have a tremendously difficult time with this, especially, especially in current year, is Trump. I am bringing him up not to be political, but because I know the emotional response that will instantly have for most of you. If you are unable to get past that, what makes you think you can get past chapter one? Just, just, just a thought. Um, if you are unable to get past that sense, you're going, I feel like you're going to have a tremendously difficult time. I'm not saying he does things right. I'm not saying that he's a wonderful person. I am saying that according to chapter one, your attitude towards him would show just how well you receive or think you can go forth with what this book states. Because this book um, is very clear as to the approach you should take to people like Trump and to people you don't like and people in politics, neighbors, bosses, whoever. If you're unable to get past that point, it's, it's going to, according to at least what I can gather from this book, it's going to be a little difficult for you to make the kind of friends and influences you're looking to meet. Maybe not with the people you don't want to make, but if you come across somebody who has just a little bit of a similarity and you react the way you do towards other people, well, that's what you get. Um, it's kind of why we are in the state uh, that we are, I feel, is that because we've all gotten used to condemning, demonizing uh, groups of people. We haven't stopped to listen to uh, what they have to say, why they are saying that way, why they feel that way. Um, and it's just, it's a very important lesson, and I just, I ask that you take it into consideration, because I certainly have. With that being said, I will see you guys for the next video. Bye-bye!